This will be the first video in a new learning series. I do these series from time to time to different levels of completeness for a small group I started on Facebook called the RPG Learning Group. It got its beginning on G+, but G+, is sadly no longer with us. So, if you watch the video and you've got questions or you've played the game yourself and you have insights and that sort of thing, leave a comment on this video here on YouTube or join on Facebook, our group there, and uh, be part of whatever discussion might happen. Now, in the past I've chosen games that I've been quite excited about, that uh, I'm not having any particular trouble with, and that I expect to get to the table to play. But I thought I would like to open the series up to games that I'm struggling with also. So it won't just be games that I like. So we can also demonstrate the process of trying to, to either at least understand a game system or a genre or an approach that doesn't, at first glance, appeal. Or that is mechanically challenging or confusingly written or any one of a hundred other things that could negatively impact on your ability to learn, play, and enjoy a new game. So, a game that I backed on Kickstarter that I was quite you know, pleased with. It's, it's kind of in my wheelhouse in terms of genre. It's a game that reminded me of Luther Arkwright, which I enjoy a great deal. A game that reminded me of the series Planetary. Uh, reminded me in, in some regards, if we were to push toward comedy of, you know, Men in Black and, and that kind of thing. It's a game where there are many different species, beings, you know, extraplanar beings or whatever, uh, all able to interact with each other and all able to move freely around. And so therefore, this interaction needs some kind of administration and making sure that things stay peaceful for everyone. The game is called Agents of Concordia. And when I backed it on Kickstarter, I went for the limited edition version, which is black and silver. It's quite nice. And the only reason why I go for these editions is that my sense of aesthetics simply prefers a planar book cover. Uh, I like the look of leather or faux leather if I have my choice. So... As this Kickstarter was progressing, a lot of pretty fantastic, from my point of view, art was presented. And one of my Kickstarter rewards was, was this, which is not going to show up very well in the video, but suffice it to say, I find art like this kind of interesting, particularly for you know, a role-playing game setup. So it had attractive art in a, uh, let's say, a, a realistic style. Let's see if I can show some more interior art. You know, it's just lightning striking on a, on a quiet street. So, I backed it. And I got it. And then I started reading it, and then I started having some trouble. So, what did I have trouble with? I had a little bit of trouble with how the game describes itself compared to what the system is, how the system approaches resolving things. And so anyone who grew up with the original World of Darkness or the second edition World of Darkness or the revised World of Darkness, you'll have a... a a strong sense probably of what I'm talking about, about how the game is saying play is going to feel like this, but because of the interaction between players and the system, it ends up being over here, something like that. So I intend to go through this uh, section by section, maybe not always chapter by chapter. There'll be a series of videos and if you have the game, or if you've been interested in the game, or if 
my description of being an agent of Concordia tasked with, you know, let's say, keeping the peace between a lot of very, very interesting different types of beings from very different places, then let's communicate together about it. All right, so let's open it up. On the cover of this edition, and in some other art assets that go with uh, the standard edition, you'll see this sigil, and around the sigil, it says scholarship, confrontation, infiltration, observation, and then finally, exploration. It's kind of cool. And inside we have a description or a symbolic representation of the multiverse, which sets us up for how all of these different beings end up being able to come together. And then we have our clear credit, who our playtesters are, who our creators are, that sort of thing. And this was a project which saw a vast amount of creative control and oversight by a gentleman named Simon Nystrom. And uh, that level of involvement at pretty much every stage of production except for proofreading that typically is a good thing. And we'll see if it is as we go through here. So getting to the table of content, so the table of contents, we have the last item appearing on, what page? Yes, appearing on page 168. And that's where the included adventure begins. So the core book covers a welcome, how to play a pen and paper RPG, a primer, and then the rules. And then the rules are broken down into checks, target numbers, uh, bonuses and penalties, uh, combat specifically, uh, then a history section, and then uh, descriptions of core locations. And then on page 45, we get to what's described as being the player's handbook. So the core book per table of contents description runs from page 1 to page 44. And then the player's book starts at page 45 and runs through until the adventure. So, yeah, let's take a look. The core book opens up. You know, with a, a nice page here that says, the first thing an agent learns is to trust the agency and that her loyalty to the greater good must outweigh all other ambitions. It's the duty of each agent to help her fellow agents resolve all challenges in a way that's favorable to the Concord and its inhabitants. Well, okay. I think I would have preferred uh, the use of they there as the non-specific, non-gendered pronoun that anybody can connect with, rather than specifically defaulting to her rather than his. Uh, it sets up a false, uh, a false dichotomy. It's, it's not necessary, right? We don't know what gender, what outlook, what orientation our player character is going to have. They are an unknown item of information. And so it's appropriate, proper, and grammatically correct to refer to them as they. Just throwing that in there. All right, we get on page two, welcome. Hi, it says, and welcome to the agency. Now we've just read that we should learn to trust the agency and be loyal to the greater good above all else. That's the perspective. That's the very first message that the book is giving us about Agents of, Con Agents of Concordia. It's the duty of each agent to help fellow agents resolve all challenges in a way that's favorable to the Concord and its inhabitants. Hi, and welcome to the agency. The welcome is written by one of the primary authors. This is Christopher. And this game is produced by Strangewood Studios. And it says they are happy and excited 
that they, you know, that you want to join in on it. Creating the book has been a bumpy ride. It says, in the end, we made it. Thanks to our families, friends, and backers on Kickstarter. I like this kind of message at the beginning um, to create that sense of the people that produced it are gamers too. Uh, in the gaming hobby, we have different levels of creation, don't we? We have hired guns, uh, people who are professional and skilled writers, but who don't play the game that they're writing for. And we have people who are maybe sitting down for the very first time to produce text in this kind of volume with this kind of objective, teaching someone a game that you have labored to produce. It's a pretty broad spectrum of talent, ability, experience, and, and so on. So I kind of like to know who uh, the people are and how they feel about their game. So we at Strange would surely hope you and your friends have a good time with this book and be sure to contact us if you wonder about something. That's nice. Well, it opens up with a pretty fantastic image of a stormy sea coast that doesn't look like anything on Earth. And it says, How to Play a Pen and Paper RPG. Okay. And this is pretty standard for the perspective of you have somehow gotten in your hands a role-playing game and you have no idea <laughs> what that means or, or what it is. So we'll, we'll gloss over that part because I, I figure if you're watching this channel, this is stuff that you already know. It's, it's nice. It's friendly. Then it goes into how to be a ship shape player. Right? Uh, as you've probably figured out, the point of playing an RPG is not to win against the other players, but to experience and create exciting stories together. The golden rule for this is each participant is responsible for entertaining the others. Now, you may or may not agree with a statement uh, like this. I like to look at it uh, from the reverse. Uh, each participant is responsible for, let's say, being entertaining, maybe, but I'm more concerned, personally, about not producing barriers to other people's fun. In other words, I'm seeking agreement. We all come together, we figure out what it is that we want to do, how much we want to be challenged by it, and, and that kind of stuff, and then we try and try and get it. When I put the focus on entertaining someone else, then now I'm in the role of performance, and the type of play that seems most natural to me, the, the one that I would default to, is more based on experience rather than the projection of performance. It's rather the observation and participation in an experience. So I imagine that we 100% agree on the feeling of fun play. How we describe it is different, and it remains to be seen how a statement like this, it's your job to entertain the other people, connects with what they really meant and what the game enables or what the game you know resists in some way how to be a good game master follows there's more on the subject later in the book in the game master chapter uh, there are a lot of different play styles and adventures to run but the most important part is that the people in the room have fun so then you know by extension if you're doing something that blocks the fun or if you're getting information or signals about this was fun, this wasn't fun, but not acting on them, then there's trouble, right? If it's still confusing, if you want some hands-on examples of pen and paper games being played, we recommend watching and listening to one of the numerous popular podcasts out there readily available on the internet. Actual play, yes. Actual play is extremely valuable. And there's a difference between actual play and professional performance of a game, which may not involve any play at all, and it may not be obvious that there's no actual play 
in the play performance until you watch a bunch of them. And that's kind of a shame. <laughs> so, the primer. The primer begins on page 5. What's a primer, it says. The primer is a short introduction to the game, the system, how it's meant to be played, and the basic point of the backstory. This is something I think more games can benefit from, right? If you read only three pages in this book, I recommend these three. <laughs> and if you want to read the rest, I still recommend reading this part first. Okay, and it also advises that before you actually play the game, everybody should have read these three pages. I'm going to assume that page five is not one of those three pages. And I am correct. All right, so page six, page seven, and page eight are the three pages in question. And it starts out with how it's meant to be played. How it's meant to be played. First sentence, this part is not law. We all play RPGs in different ways. Nonetheless, the system supports a specific style of play. There are as many ways to have fun with this game as there are RPG groups. But if you're looking for a particular type of experience, it's fair to get a sense of what the system and narrative do best. Then I think they very intelligently go for what it is not first. That's easier to describe. It says, even if the game is action-oriented, it is not specifically combat-oriented. It is not intricately balanced to make sure all players are equal in combat. This is a very important thing to contribute or to explain up front, depending on the background that you're coming from. Right? And this doesn't mean specifically players of, of highly tactical, uh, highly detailed systems which allow for a lot of you know specificity in the arena of combat. There are a bunch of different backgrounds which might react to the idea of inequality between uh, character types. Be very attractive to some people, uh, initially off-putting, but turn out to be not all that bad for other people or a non-starter for, for some others. So, uh, the game is not meant to be played with miniatures. It's not intended for players to focus on the mechanics of combat. Fighting is specifically designed to be fast-paced and action-packed. More part of a story and drama rather than a standalone mechanic. Doesn't have long scenes of combat. Uh, focuses on scenes, and we've broken down the scenes to combat, infiltration, investigation, exploration, and research. or the in-game perspective of that confrontation, infiltration, observation, exploration, and scholarship. These categories represent the themes of the game, and each part is designed to encompass one-fifth of the game rules. That's interesting. The game is not meant to be argued about. <laughs> I just like that. That's, that's hopeful and optimistic. Uh, you'll find that one specific mechanic, the support and cripple system, replies a lot on the fact that the players can accept the rulings of the game master and lend to their disbelief and mistrust for safekeeping. Hmm, that's a very confusing sentence. Let's look at it again. The support and cripple system relies a lot on the fact that the players can accept the rulings of the game master. Ah, I see what they did. And lend to the Game Master, their disbelief and mistrust for safekeeping while they play the game. So it's talking about the willful suspension of disbelief and trust in the Game Master. And we're going to have to assume that the Game Master has to not abuse that trust. The Agents of Concordia Multiversal play and belongs to the Game Master and the game will thrive if the players accept that. In this particular universe, drama and story will sometimes be prioritized over realism. There's a lot of ideas in there. And discussing this kind of thing is exactly what I like to do during a, a session zero or the formation of a new group or the selection of a new game. It really needs to be out there. Is this game going for realism? something along the lines of the moral project where the violence in the system is you know 
uh, intricately modeled. And if you're playing with, with doctors or uh, EMTs or, or this kind of, of person, they won't have too much to complain about in terms of what the mechanics cause to happen. Compared to something like watching an 80s action movie where in the injury a character takes seems to be more a matter of convenience or drama rather than uh, a matter of real-world experience. Like you might get shot in the shoulder and everything's fine and as the movie or TV series progresses, there is no indication that that injury was was important at all. It's like being shot in the shoulder is code for an unimportant injury kind of thing. But we can jump out of whatever story of building as long as it serves the continuation of enjoyment in the moment. That's one end of the scale or... Um, we're going to have a method of calculating how much damage you take depending on how far you fall being at the other end of the perspective. So they've let us know where the mechanics are supposed to sit more toward drama and story than toward a realistic experience. And they've also told us, and this is a separate point, but it's been bundled together that there are going to be secrets and mysteries that are going to be revealed and that it's the responsibility of the player who takes on the role of the Game Master to open those up and reveal them to people to be interacted with. Because there are some games out there where anybody at the table can put in a new item, new element, uh, expose a mystery, or, or uh, create a, a new thread of action. This is not that kind of game either. It's not way over into GMless territory, and it's not way over into simulation of reality. What it is comes next. All right. So the rule system is called the Pentivity system. Remember, it was referred to as being one fifth, one fifth, one fifth. Right. So the Pentivity system is designed with an action and mystery focused game in mind. It supports quick decisions, fluid gameplay and actions where you describe crazy stunts and wild gambles. It thrives on situations where the Game Master goes, wow, that's terrific, roll the dice. Uh, you get a plus three bonus for good narrative. We call this a friendly narrative game where Game Master and player work together to produce a good story. All right, so we have to interpret that by what's gone before. This game is designed to be supportive of a character's story and development, and it does this without worrying too much about numbers and statistics. The primer then goes into the story, which is the, what they mentioned earlier, the background, like what is Agents of Concordia all about. And so the game is centered around being an agent of CCI, the Concordia Central Intelligence, which is an agency charged with the protection of a vast fantasy multiverse. All right. It goes into the politics. It goes into the prime location. Concordia Prime is the only official way to get to or from Earth. There are good reasons to keep the Concord a secret, and the CCI work tire tirelessly to screen all visitors. Aether, or Ether is the source of power and life in the multiverse. We've got gates to travel between worlds is not through space, but through magical gates. Now we know that there is magic involved. The stuff between dimensions is called the void and consists of solid nothingness. Fascinating. Technology. In the Concord, there are all sorts of technology, both arcane and mechanical. The untold number of worlds that are included in the Concord were all on different advancement levels when they joined from medieval kingdoms or clans to highly advanced civilizations. The most advanced are the Alden, and so on and so forth. So this is, there are three pages of overview. We want you to imagine play being closer to action movie reality than reality. We want you to relax and trust the Game Master to, because 
it's a mystery oriented game and so the game master will prepare mysteries for the characters to use their abilities to solve through the vehicle of their players <laughs> and it's supposed to be fast and the game master is supposed to encourage high levels of description and reward them mechanically in play so we should see if we were to watch an actual play of this we should see people talking we see people listening and suggesting having fun and the game master responding and the more dynamic and the more expressive you're able to get the more often you can expect to earn mechanical bonuses and then as the ability and comfort and familiarity with the game improves in the group then your standard for judging that can also improve so you can keep pushing yourself toward uh, greater control of how you envision a scene how you cooperatively interact with the scene how you describe it and so on and so forth so that's that's all pretty cool and exciting to me then we get into primer the rules and on this page there is a call out box saying GM tip the most important rule of all wing it I do agree with the sentiment be willing to make a ruling if you don't understand a rule and gameplay is just going to come crashing to a halt recognize that problem decide in the moment if the group should come to a stop and learn the rule or if you should gloss over it and talk about it later because of reasons that are particular to you your group and that moment or if there is no rule to cover what you need be willing to make it up and move on or if there seems to be some discomfort with how something works with the rules or if nobody remembers how something is supposed to be in the book and so on and so forth decide in the moment do we look it up or do we carry on having that kind of comfort with each other and with the game I think is really healthy I don't think that as a as a band-aid over problems that this should be the approach especially when learning the game I think a little bit of effort with the, the book open on the table as you're learning is really useful it prevents mislearning <laughs> it prevents uh, misconceptions from forming and it through repetition through discovery through read apply right and review it gets the game into your head so that the group at least can build a different repertoire of of game systems approaches methodology styles and so on and so forth so that every subsequent game becomes easier to learn if there's a way to do something and you had to wing it I think the group does deserve to hear about it after that the authors want the game to be fun and they want you to do whatever is necessary to make the, the game fun when people sit down to play it and perhaps they're thinking of it from the point of view of this is someone's first time to play and there are a lot of things that come up during play of a new game where play stops right people have questions they don't understand something some part of their character sheet isn't complete or so on and so forth the game master is suddenly pushed into having to make a ruling and they're not prepared with enough understanding of the rules to do that that kind of stuff perhaps the authors don't want us to be in that situation and so they say right up front wing it just just have fun but if we carry that through to its logical extension then we don't need anybody's games we can just wing anything right uh, roll a d6 or you know roll 5d20 and take the average or you see what I'm saying so someone has taken the time to put together a system which obviously they think works enough to be encoded into a book and marketed why not learn it right 
And the more effort and dedication you put in at the beginning, better play will be sooner. Anyway, get off my soapbox on that. So the rules. We've got checks. Players roll all checks. The Game Master can roll if they want to. But all statistics for the enemies and non-player characters are pre-rolled, so the Game Master doesn't have to. And this is something that I appreciate about the Ubiquity role-playing system, is that there's a method for the Game Master to not have to stop what they're doing to roll. They can roll if they like, because it's fun. But if a scene is too large or too complicated or whatever, being able to not roll as the Game Master can be a real benefit. If you haven't tried it, it can be very off-putting. It can feel like you're cheating or it can feel like, you know, uh, there's something missing because you've always rolled before. But maybe if you try it, you'll really like it. You'll discover your mind is freer to put in more description, to have, uh, especially in theater, the mind or abstracted play, you have more capacity to to bring that more to life. So, players make all the checks. Uh, it describes a skill check as you grab one to three 12-sided dice. Who doesn't like rolling 12-siders? Right, the 12-sided dice is the only type of game, the only type of dice used in the game. And you will find that the number you need is equal to your character's skill level. So we'll have a skill level for one die, a skill level for two dice, and a skill level for three dice. You roll them, and you choose one to keep, and you add bonuses or penalties from abilities, equipment, and conditions to the rolled number, and compare the result to a target number set by the Game Master. Every time you beat the target number, you get an additional effect. I didn't say that right. Every time you beat the target number, you get an additional effect. This could be a dramatic or a rule effect, and it's going to be more obvious in combat, they admit. The central principle is if you beat the target multiple times in a single roll, you get the same amount of effects. Okay, so now it's clear. This beating the target to me means my target number was was five and I rolled a six. I beat the target, right, if I'm successful. What they meant was if you beat it by the same amount as the target. So if the target number was five and you rolled 11, that's their example, you have beat it once and so you get an additional effect, right? So if you got 16, then you'd get two and that kind of stuff. Okay, that makes sense. Some people might find this to be a little bit of math. <laughs> Some people, you know, won't. But recognizing, remembering, uh, remembering to do it, that kind of stuff. Uh, if you're familiar with playing Savage Worlds, this will be pretty easy. This is already a, a habit that you have. But uh, Circumstances that would affect your role are called support or cripple effects. These give you either plus three or minus three, respectively. And it's up to the GM to decide when you get support or cripple and what you get it from. Okay. They explain why it's plus three and minus three. Yeah. Then we get into the actual rules. Checks. Target numbers. Let's take a look at the target numbers. Easy. Target number three to five. So remember, you might be rolling one d12. Right. So we're thinking we're going to have uh, an average of six, seven, eight in there. Normal, six to eight. Hard, nine to eleven, and very hard. 12 or better, and we can roll higher than 12 because we might have a uh, support bonus. Okay, and they describe the difficulties, but easy, normal, hard, very hard.
they have a callout box for why not adjust the target number rather than giving us plus three, minus three boost from supports or cripples. So it says, first of all, support and cripple effects do not affect the success levels like changing the target number would. This means that the possibility of incredible success is not moved as much. Because remember, if you can double or triple or quadruple uh, the target number, then uh, you'll have all these additional successes. But if we adjust the target number to make it harder or to make it easier, the opportunity for that is altered. Okay, success levels. We have a story effect, a support effect, a cripple effect, additional damage. Each time you beat the target number beyond the first, you gain an additional effect. This effect is a powerful thing, and in addition to your success in the task, you can spend each success level to gain an advantage, followed by a story effect. Uh, you manage what you wanted and more. Decide with the GM what your effect will be. They give an example. Getting an opportunity to lock the door behind you during an escape. Pretty cool. A support effect. You or your friend gain support on a falling roll, so you gain plus three. A cripple effect. You get a minus three for whoever you'd like to inflict it on. Additional damage. So this is pretty straightforward. We move into timing. Situations and specific rules. Confrontation. This is combat exploration. We've got survival. Chases. Scholarship. This covers research. Magic. Dealing with fear. Repairing things. Now it starts to get into some nitty gritty. So I think we'll stop here. This video has been long enough and I imagine people will have a specific interest in, in combat rules uh, because of the long and violent history of, of role playing games and, and the people who play them. But uh, anyway, here endeth the first look into the beginning sections of Agents of Concordia by Strangewood studios. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is a game that I'm struggling with a little bit, not because of the setting at all. I quite like the setting, but I wonder how its mechanics play into or play against their claims about the game. What is it about me and the way that I view mechanics and systems and, and the abstraction or specificity of math that is giving me trouble. Maybe going through the series, I'll be able to figure that out. And maybe going through the series, you might become interested in getting this game, giving it a try, and talking about it with other people. So anyway, until the next installment, take care.